grace, mercy, and peace to you from God the Creator in Jesus Christ our Lord. Welcome to Lawrenceville First Christian Church. We are so glad that you are here, whether you are online, listening in, watching us later in the week. We are grateful for your presence. Thank you. You may be wondering why Diane and I are wearing red today. It is one year celebration of my ordination that happened on the 15th of last year. So on our ordination celebration Sunday, we get to wear our red stoles. So that is why you see us in red this morning. Um, just glory to you that we um, are here today. So thankful to see you. Um, missed you last week, but we had a fabulous vacation. So I appreciate all the warm wishes. Please stand and join us for the responsive call to worship. Come all who look for God with unseeing eyes. Come all who listen for God but hear nothing. The word of God is living and active. It pierces and judges and opens us to God's grace. We cannot hide from God who knows us. God understands your thoughts and intentions. Leave everything to worship Jesus in this hour. This is the time to embrace new ways. Here we set the patterns for everyday life. Here we are strengthened for every day's challenges. Good morning. Today you need your purple chalice praise. We haven't had it out in a while, okay? The purple chalice praise. And a couple weeks ago we sang 25 songs from the chalice hymnal, so I figured it's time to do something from the praise book. We're going to start on page 16, High and Exalted.
as we prepare, prepare to go to God in prayer, I'd like to remind you of a couple of prayers that we need to extend to our community. Um, one is that Maria, if any of you know Maria, she was Miss Nettie's helper. Um, she is going to be um, going into chemotherapy, so we'll keep her in our prayers. Um, Rob Breaker's sister Connie is recovering from knee surgery. Um, family and friends of Karen and John Werner, who are friends of Nancy Groves, please keep um, those friends in your prayers. Um, also, Miss Eva and Miss Neva um, have been having health issues and have not been with us, so please keep them in your prayers. Let us go to God. God of infinite patience and wisdom, we come to you with many things that claim our time, energy, resources, and lives. We are quickly drawn away from serving you by the world's enticements of wealth, ease, and comfort. <clears throat> Just like the young man in the scriptures, we are owned by our possessions, held captive by our treasures. You continue to offer us healing and hope. You seek to transform our lives from captivity to freedom in witness and service. We look at the world in which there is so much warfare and strife, anger and hatred, and we quickly become overwhelmed by the needs and the stress. Lord, prepare us to be able to deal with these stressors in our lives. Lord, we also pray for those affected by the recent hurricanes and those who help and support them. Help us place our lives and our trust in you, knowing that with your help, many wonderful things can be accomplished to provide hope and peace for others and ourselves. Please give us the strength, the courage to be your disciples Bless us this day with lives filled with love, caring, generosity, and deep abiding hope. We pray that your kingdom will dwell among all people and that we may be instruments of your love and grace. Holy Spirit, open our hearts with joy of healing a world filled with brokenness and pain. Be in our lives in the name of the one who taught us the way, the light, and the love, saying as you taught us to pray, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
scripture this morning is from Mark chapter 10, verses 17 through 31. As he was setting out on a journey, a man ran up and knelt before him and asked him, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good but God alone. You know the commandments. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness. You shall not defraud. Honor your father and mother. He said to him, Teacher, I have kept all these since my youth. Jesus, looking at him, loved him and said, You lack one thing. Go, sell what you own, and give the money to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come, follow me. When he heard this, he was shocked and went away grieving, for he had many possessions. Then Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, How hard it will be for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of God. And the disciples were perplexed at these words. But Jesus said to them again, Children, how hard it is to enter the kingdom of God. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. They were greatly astounded and said to one another, Then who can be saved? Jesus looked at them and said, For mortals it is impossible, but not for God. For God all things are possible. Peter began to say to him, Look, we have left everything and followed you. Jesus said, Truly I tell you, there is no one who has left house or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or fields for my sake, and for the sake of the good news, who will not receive a hundredfold now in this age. Houses, brothers and sisters, mothers and children and field with persecutions, and on the age to come eternal life. But many who are first will be last, and the last will be first. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Good morning. Will you pray with me? Take my lips, O Lord, and speak through them. Take our minds and think with them. Take our hearts and set them on fire. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Once upon a time, many, many years ago, in the first few months of 2020, we were all living our normal everyday lives when suddenly a big, bad, unknown virus came calling and upset the entire world as we know it. And one of the first ways we reacted was panicked buying of stuff. Toilet paper, Clorox wipes, hand sanitizer, food. I remember searching all over Athens in April of 2020 for a bag of flour and finally getting one of the last two bags available at a Walgreens. At the beginning of what would be a months-long, even years-long global pandemic, we expressed our fear and uncertainty by buying stuff. In many cases, way, way more stuff than we actually needed. Let's face it, the story of the rich man in Mark's Gospel is a tough one, with a message that's hard to swallow. After all, most of us really like our stuff. Sometimes we relieve stress by going shopping. I'll admit I stopped and bought some socks online while I was writing this sermon. We're proud of the things we own, and too often we collect far more than we actually need. But one of the key messages in today's story is to let go of things, including things we think are important, in order to receive much more than we ever expected both in this life and in the next. This was the situation of the rich man who came to ask Jesus an important question. The scriptures don't tell us much about this man other than that he was wealthy. We don't know his age or how he came to have wealth or how he became interested in the traveling rabbi Jesus and his band of followers. 
But we do know that when Jesus came through his town, this man came forward to ask Jesus a question. It's not clear whether, whether or not Jesus knew immediately that the man was rich, although it's, it's not hard to imagine that the man's wealth was apparent in his clothes, his confidence, his mannerisms. In previous encounters with people in other towns, the disciples tried to prevent the people from bothering Jesus with their concerns. And yet the disciples let this man through. Wealth has its privileges, even among the disciples who were closest to Jesus. It might be tempting to assume that this man was overbearing, trying to trick Jesus with his question. But despite his wealth, the man was actually quite earnest. He really wanted to connect with Jesus. He began by addressing Jesus respectfully as good teacher. He clearly had been paying attention to what Jesus was teaching, and he asked an important and challenging question. What must I do to inherit eternal life? He truly admired Jesus and wanted to follow him. Jesus first challenged his greeting, returning the focus to God by saying, no one is good but God alone. Jesus wanted to be sure this man understood that he, Jesus, was not a replacement for God. He was the representative of God's coming rule. And as Jesus began to answer this man's question about how to inherit eternal life, the rich man probably felt some relief. For Jesus started by listing several of the commandments that all devout Jews followed. The commandments handed down by, Mo by God to Moses. Do not murder. Do not steal. Do not commit adultery. Do not bear false witness. Honor your father and mother. Whew, the rich man was an observant Jew himself. He knew he'd followed all of these commandments carefully since he was young. He probably thought he was all set, that eternal life was guaranteed to him. But then Jesus added some twists, as Jesus tended to do. The first twist is kind of easy to miss because it's buried in the list of commandments that Jesus shared. You shall not defraud. That's not one of the Ten Commandments handed down to Moses, so why would Jesus mention it specifically? This may have been a commentary on the man's wealth. Even though Jesus did not know this man very well, he was acquainted with other wealthy people and knew that many of them earned their wealth by defrauding others, especially poor peasant farmers. This commandment was a powerful reminder to be aware of how you make and maintain your wealth. It's not clear whether the man actually heard and understood this message, but he did affirm that he followed all of the, had followed all of the commandments since his youth. At this point in the story, there's a small exchange between Jesus and the rich man that's sometimes overlooked. Jesus looked at the man and loved him. So much so that Jesus invited him to join the disciples and follow him. But then Jesus added another twist, one that ultimately was too much for this man. Sell all your possessions and give the money to the poor. I wonder if the rich man stood there for a few minutes, thinking about everything he owned and everything he'd have to give up to follow Jesus. In any case, he just couldn't do it. And he went away filled with shock and grief. He just could not let go of the comfort and status that his wealth afforded. And in this moment, he became the only person in all of the Gospels to refuse Jesus' call to follow him. The message may sound harsh to our contemporary ears. After all, the man was a devout Jew who followed all of the commandments, and still that wasn't enough. Why did Jesus ask the man to give up all of his possessions? Jesus may not have known that the man was rich. He may simply have been asking the same thing he had requested of each of the disciples he called. Leave your family, leave your home, leave your fishing nets, leave it all behind and follow me. And at the same time, Jesus may have been asking the man to give up what was holding him back from loving God completely. 
not the possessions themselves, but his attachment to wealth and to the security and prestige and privilege that came with it. This story may have resonated in a special way with those who first heard it read aloud. The story is found in Mark's Gospel, written in about 70 CE, somewhere around 40 years after the death and resurrection of Jesus. It was a challenging time for early Christians, to say the least. They faced persecution, torture, and even death at the hands of the Roman Empire, not only for following Jesus, but also for being devout Jews. At the time Mark's Gospel was written, the temple in Jerusalem had been destroyed by the Roman Empire. The small community of Christians who made up Mark's church had made difficult choices, including leaving family and friends behind to follow Christ. They would have understood both the challenge and the importance of giving up the things that hold you back to follow Jesus. And yet, the disciples did not understand an unfortunately common theme in Mark's gospel. Once the man had left, Jesus turned to his disciples to elaborate on wealth and the kingdom of God using a strange and memorable image. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. Biblical scholars over the years have struggled to understand the camel through the eye of the needle metaphor. Some scholars believe that the scribes who copied this scripture made an error, substituting the Greek word camelos, meaning camel, for the original word kamelos, meaning rope. But even reading the word as rope doesn't really help, for a rope can't go through the eye of a needle either. Other scholars point to an ancient myth of the needle's eye gate. It was said to be a small narrow gate in, in the wall into Jerusalem, too narrow and too low for a fully loaded camel to go through. The camel would have to have its burdens removed and squat down low to pass through this gate. Of course, the needle's eye gate is not mentioned anywhere in the Bible, and there's no historical evidence that it actually existed. It is a myth. And trying to explain the camel through the eye of the needle misses the point that Jesus was making. It's impossible, not just hard, for a rich person to get into God's kingdom on their own. It was an extreme illustration of impossibility, impossibility, one the disciples would have understood. And it's clear that they did understand the implication of Jesus' message, for they looked at each other in astonishment perhaps threw up their hands in frustration and said, well, then who can be saved? Peter, always the one to speak out, added that each of them had left everything to follow Jesus. You can almost hear the frustration, the irritation, even the whine in Peter's voice. I've given up everything for you. Are you telling me that's not enough to get into God's kingdom? But Jesus quieted him down and shared two important messages, messages that are still important for us today. God can do anything, even things that are impossible for humans. And giving up things, even important things, can lead to receiving gifts much greater than you ever expected. The first message sounds obvious. God can do anything. But take a minute to think about what that really means. The rich man could not earn his place in the kingdom of God, just as we can't earn God's grace through anything we do, no matter how generous, no matter how well-intentioned. Jesus was reminding his followers that only God alone can save us, the best of us and also the worst of us. Being dependent on God is hard for many of us. We like to be the ones in control, the ones making the decisions about what happens to us. But this is a place where we can't do anything. We must simply receive our place in the kingdom as a gift from the generous God who loves us all completely. Nothing is impossible for God, even if it seems impossible to our human eyes. And there's another important message in this story of the rich man and Jesus. 
in giving up things that are important for the sake of our faith, we receive so much more than we ever expected. In Mark's community of early Christians, many people had to choose between their faith and their family, especially if family members did not share that faith. Many early Christians left their home and family to be part of this new movement called The Way and they became a part of a much larger family in their new community of faith. So what are our barriers to truly following Jesus? Where do we choose security, privilege, or prestige instead of Jesus? It can be hard to resist the allure of wealth and power and the pressures of our consumer culture. But the message of Jesus is countercultural. Give to the poor. Take care of those who need your help. Love those who seem most unlovable. The early Christian community was built on a model of generous hospitality, where all were welcomed and treated as equals, where everyone had enough to take care of all of their needs. Jesus beckons us to give up our attachment to our possessions and extend this same generous hospitality. Does this mean you have to sell everything and rely on the hospitality of strangers to have somewhere to live and food to eat? No. What Jesus calls us to do, calls us to let go of, is our attachment to our possessions, our power and our privilege that we, that we hold that makes our life simple. So I invite you this week to take some time to reflect on how you view your worldly possessions, how God is guiding you to engage with his kingdom on earth, and what you might need to give up in order to best serve God's people. Amen. Having now read ancient scripture together and heard the word and sung songs of faith, you have an opportunity to respond. If this is the sort of faith community you've been looking for, where we wrestle with big questions and care for one another, you're invited to talk to Teresa or me or any of our leaders about membership. Let us stand and sing together verses 1 and 2 of As the Deer, number 108 in the Purple Shallow Spring. <laughs> It is hard for us as humans. In today's world, most of the time, it seems that who, who, who dies with the most toys wins. Um, my dad always said we needed to give to charity and help others. He said he had never seen a Brinks truck in a funeral possession. 
So many of us get sucked into the commercialism and pressure of our world to have the most worldly and monetary possessions to be happy. As I've been working on the church budget during our cruise this past week, I realized that it would be irresponsible to give up all of our possessions as disciples did to follow Jesus. Let's face it, there are bills that have to be paid. There are expenses that are non-negotiable, such as we found out our church insurance was vital that we needed it in the build, to be stewards of the building that we've been blessed with. I like to think we are stewards of our possessions since all we have is given to us by God and truly belongs to God. At the end of life, we have to leave someone to be in charge of distributing our wealth and possessions as per our wishes. As I've been doing this with my mom's estate, it became very aware to Kim and I that we have too much stuff and possessions. Oh, if we could live more simply and trust in God's promises from our scripture today. One thing we can always count on and trust is God's love for us and his gift of his son Jesus Christ who gave his life so we could live eternally with all of God's riches. We celebrate this today as we come to this table spread by us by Jesus himself so that we can be fed and strengthened to serve him here on earth. Come to the table, all are welcome. Merciful God, it is that time of year that we start to feel change in the weather and in nature. It is that time of year we seek to be comforted and nourished. Here around this table we find just that. Nourishment of the Spirit through the bread and cup. Comfort in remembering the promises of Jesus at the table. Now let us take the bread and cup. Let us give thanks for all that it symbolizes. In Jesus' name. Receive from the Lord what I have also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is broken for you. 
do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, also the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Jesus told the young questioner information and insight into eternal life. You lack one thing, Christ said. Go sell what you own and give the money to the poor, and you will have treasures in heaven. Then come and follow me. Our Christian discipleship is threatened as long as we rely on all that we have accumulated. We give out our thanks. We give out our joy. But let us remember that it is these possessions that tend to hold us back. And when Christ and the love of our God come first, we are more concerned about our neighbors than ourselves. You may give to Lawrenceville First Christian Church by placing your offering in the plates in the back of the sanctuary, by clicking donate on the website or mailing your checks to the church. As Jimmy said, we have responsibilities, and that is to do God's work. Let us join now in standing and singing the doxology. Thank you. For the wealth you have entrusted to us. As we share a portion of that wealth, we pray that it may never become the object of our affection. Keep focusing on people, relationship, and lasting values rather than on the possessions we have accumulated. We dedicate our time, our money, and ourselves to the reign of God among us, praying that all our gifts may receive mercy and find grace to help in times of need. Amen. A couple of announcements for this Sunday. Uh, Sunday School is back in gear. We start next Sunday with the major prophets. So if you are thinking about joining us, we start a new topic next week. So please come and join us at 10 a.m. Trunk or Treat is October 27th. We need volunteer trunks with the treater to hand out the treat, not just the trunk. We need candy, we need prayers, there are sign-up sheets on the table. Week of Compassion is where you can donate to help with the hurricane relief. Please remember the Lawrenceville co-opt in this time. Sandy Lawrenceville has been assigned green beans, so please bring green beans along with anything um, on the list that you see in our egram. The annual apple trip will be on Thursday, October 24th. Meet here at the church at 10 a.m. Let's Eat is this Tuesday here at the Frontera, right around the corner off of Five Forks Trickham. If you haven't already, see Anna to sign up. We have a big event happening on November 3rd. Um, it will be Diane and I's 
and our installation. It's All Saints Sunday and it's the CWF Harvest Meal. So we need the place packed. Disciples Women Retreat has been postponed. More information about that. The prayer garden continues. Um, see Jeannie if you'd like to volunteer. That's on Saturday mornings. Finance and facilities will meet the 17th, which is Thursday night at 630. Happy belated birthday to Reverend Diane, who had a birthday last week on the 8th. And happy anniversary to Dennis and Betty on their anniversary, which will be Wednesday the 16th. Congratulations. Oh, yes. Outreach tomorrow, 6.30, Zoom, Monday. Anything else I missed? You have been made free by the love of God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Go into the world to serve God by helping others. Be at peace and bring God's peace and love with you wherever you go. And go in the grace of the God who created you and loves you, the God who has saved you and redeemed you, and the God who sustains you and is with you always. Amen. Amen.